In this episode of Travelog, I'm heading to southwest China, where finds from a sophisticated Bronze Age kingdom are changing the very narrative of the origin of Chinese civilization. These might look like works of contemporary art, but in fact, these are replicas of ancient bronze relics created by a mysterious civilization more than 3,000 years ago. And that civilization is Sanxingdui. But who were they? Why did they create these artworks and what were they for? I'm here to unravel those secrets. I've come to Guanghan in Sichuan province. People have lived in this fertile part of southwest China for thousands of years. Legend, and more recently, archaeological discoveries, tell of an ancient kingdom in the area called Shu. In 1929, a farmer made a remarkable find, a trove of jade and stone artefacts. Experts identified the site as over 3,000 years old. What the farmer had stumbled upon was Sanxingdui, capital of the ancient kingdom of Shu. Nearly 60 years later, archaeologists uncovered two sacrificial pits at the site. They contained bronze statues of trees, humans and faces. Nothing like them had ever before been seen in China. Today, these extraordinary relics are housed at the Sanxingdui Museum, located nearby the original excavation site. The pieces of the puzzle that helps us understand this strange Bronze Age civilization. Among the most mysterious of Sanxingdui's relics are its bronze masks. Primal, powerful, with eyes that penetrate. Many were found to have pigment on the nostrils, mouths and ears. Perhaps they were being imbued with life. What an enigmatic face. This is the largest bronze mask of its time, and its face is full of secrets, full of mysteries. How did they make it? Who was it of? And most importantly, what was it used for? The holes along the forehead suggest this mask was hung somewhere. In fact, several giant masks have been found and experts believe they were used in ancestor worship. But who were those ancestors? It's commonly believed that this was cast in the likeness of one of the legendary kings of Sanxingdui, a man named Chan Tong. Now, supposedly he had bulging eyes, but here the eyes are exaggerated. They protrude from his face as if to say, I see everything, and his ears grow out from the sides of his head, as if to say, I can hear everything. I am the almighty god of Sanxingdui. Chan Tong, founder of the kingdom of Shu. Now this might look like the mask of Chan Tong. It has the same protruding eyes, but it also has this crest in the shape of a dragon. Now, some scholars believe this was the legendary Zhulong, a torch dragon, which created day and night by opening and closing its eyes. So perhaps the people here worshipped light. Perhaps they worshipped eyes. The eyes 
seemed to contain incredible power. Here at San Xingdui, a sea of faces, their gazes turn downward, stare until the end of time. Who are you? Nearly 60 of these incredible bronze heads were discovered at San Xingdui. But they're over 3,000 years old, yet they're still just as powerful, just as mysterious. And we believe that these heads represented the political and religious leaders at San Xingdui, comprised of both men and women. The heads come in various shapes, perhaps representing different factions or ethnicities. But the expressions are all similar. Dignified. Compelling. The most striking features are their eyes and ears. They look neither Chinese nor Western, and some have said they even look alien. But the most remarkable specimens of these bronze heads were those found covered in gold leaf. For the ancient Egyptians, gold was the colour of the gods, the embodiment of the sun. The Greeks thought it was indestructible and immutable. But what did gold represent to the people of Shu? These are the only gilded bronze masks found in China. And experts believe that they represented the highest levels of leadership at San Xingdui. If gold represented power, then this relic must have given whoever owned it the right to rule. This is a gold scepter. The only one of its kind ever to be found in China. It was a symbol of power used by the highest authority at San Xingdui, the king, or perhaps a shaman king. However, when it was first excavated, experts thought it was a golden belt, because what you see now is actually a gold sheath, which would have been wrapped around a wooden rod. And really, the devil is in the details. Here, there are three sets of images, a man with a crown, a bird, and a fish pierced by an arrow. Some people believed that this belonged to one of the legendary rulers of the Shu Kingdom, a man named Yu Fu. His name means cormorant, which is a kind of bird that is still used in China today to fish with. If the staff was a symbol of authority, then this may have been the man who wielded it. Standing over two and a half meters high, this is the world's tallest bronze figure of its time. It's likely he was a king, or perhaps a shaman king, of San Xingdui. He's barefoot, in deference to the gods. Standing on an altar shaped like mountains, or maybe elephants. His body is covered with a three-piece robe, decorated with motifs of dragons, birds, and the sun. He was the god's representative on Earth. Though he is mortal, he bore the responsibility of all his people in communicating with the divine. The rise and fall of his kingdom lay in his hands, which likely held a ritual object, perhaps an elephant tusk. And clad in full regalia, he was powerful, sacred, exalted, for he was the link between heaven and earth. He is divinity personified.
the all-powerful leader in Sensing Dui. He would have taken centre stage at sacrificial ceremonies, directing his people in their worship of the heavens. Countless kneeling figures and hordes of religious paraphernalia were discovered in the sacrificial pits. The hint at the importance of ritual worship in Sensing Dui society. We can only guess at what their ceremony might have looked like. But this is a possibility. Rows upon rows of shamans with offerings for their god, kneeling before an impressive sacrificial altar. But who or what were they praying to? Who were the gods of San Dui? Dui? This is an incredibly intricate sacrificial altar and it's split into three sections. At the top is the realm of heaven. This rectangular structure with the figures might possibly have been a heavenly palace. Beneath that, what looks like a crown is actually a mountain range and these people were likely shamans conducting a ritual ceremony. This was the realm of man and beneath them are these strange creatures. They might have been the guardians of the underworld. So three realms, the realm of heaven, the realm of man, and the realm of hell, the underworld. This might have been the universe condensed for the people of Sensing Dui. From the bronze masks, we know there was ancestor veneration. Yet it seems the sun and even birds were also worshipped here. In these relics, we sense a desire to be one with the gods. Humans working with nature, rather than fighting against it. Well, this looks familiar, doesn't it? This is a sun wheel, and during the Bronze Age, Sun worship became prevalent across the world as civilizations started to rely more and more on agriculture. And here at Sensing Dui, the sun motif can be found on many of its relics. Well, it might be small, but this statue may be just as important as its bigger cousin, the large standing bronze figure, because they have similar gestures, similar features, and it's believed that they were both high-ranking shamans. However, this gentleman is wearing a very interesting headdress, and some scholars believe it's of an elephant, with its trunk uplifted and its ears in the air. The people of San Xing Dui not only worshipped birds, they wanted to become birds. Many zoomorphic statues were found here, for example, here, human legs morph into bird's claws. What this represented was unity of humans and nature. And scholars still don't know what this does. This is a plaque that's shaped like a salmon skirt, on which are decorations of more bird motifs, perhaps of an owl because birds could ascend to the heavens, and only birds flew closest to the sun. Coming up next, we learn about life in Sensing Dui, and how its kings and shamans sought to communicate directly with the heavens. I've come to where it all began. In Chinese, Sensing Dui means three stars mound, and it gets its name from the three star-shaped mounds nearby the excavation site. Today, only half of one of the mounds remains, but experts believe this may have originally been an inner city wall. 
Many excavations have taken place since Sensing Dui's discovery. But still, experts are only just beginning to decipher its past. This is just one of the residential quarters found here at Sensing Dui. There are many more waiting to be excavated, which makes you wonder what sort of people lived here and how were they able to achieve such a high level of civilization? As the capital of the Kingdom of Shu, Sanxing Dui may have been a political, religious and commercial hub. The city was divided into districts and by looking at the clues found in the building's foundations, we can tell the architecture was quite sophisticated. The evidence is written on the wall. Just the fact that there is a city wall is remarkable because it means that there was a city to protect, that the people of San Xingdui were sophisticated, cosmopolitan, complex, and even though this wall gives us just a tiny snippet of life in San Xingdui, I bet its residents never expected that more than 3,000 years later, their lives would be laid bare for us to see. Sensing Dui reached the height of its power around the 2nd to 1st millennium BC. Experts believe the city may have contained as many as 10,000 households, a huge population for the time. This begs the question, what was life like in Sensing Dui? Sensing Dui's pottery is sometimes overlooked, but there's so much we can learn from it. For example, judging by its various different sizes and shapes, we can tell that Sensing Dui's society probably produced a diverse range of agricultural products which would have been stored inside these containers. Now, that means that the people of Sensing Dui probably ate pretty well and drank well. And for example, here, this vessel with the chubby legs would have been put over an open fire to cook with. Now it was hollow inside so you could pour wine or other liquids in to be heated up. But some people have said that this may be a very early version of Sutrani's hot pot. This elephant tusk raises a very interesting question. Where did it come from? because this tusk was discovered alongside some 80 tusks and nearly 5,000 cowrie shells. Now, one possibility is that some 3,000 years ago, elephants were native to this region. But the other more tantalizing possibility was that this was gained through trade because cowrie shells originate in the Indian Ocean. And we know that there was communication between Sensing Dui and the Central Plains, so perhaps there were trade links with civilizations even further away, with the Indus Valley, maybe even Mesopotamia. But that's a question we may never know the answer to. Cowrie shells have been found in burial sites all across the world, from Egypt to Germany, Russia to Africa. Perhaps they spread to Sensing Dui via the Ganges and Brahmaputra Delta along the fabled southwestern Silk Road. Cowrie shells were symbols of wealth and power and would eventually serve as a form of currency. Many of Sensing Dui's bronze ritual vessels were found filled with cowries and jade, precious offerings to the gods. For the Chinese, there's no more hallowed stone than jade. It was the bronzes that made Sensing Dui famous, but it was jade that caused its discovery. For the ancients, jade wasn't necessarily one kind of stone. 
As long as it was beautiful and precious enough, any stone could be called jade. For it was believed that jade had the ability to communicate with the divine. And at Sensing Dui, a multitude of jade ritual objects were discovered, from blades to daggers and discs. They were used for sacrificing to the heavens, to the mountains, and to the earth. The earliest jade pieces were used for ritual purposes. But as carving technology improved, jade became a status symbol to be worn and used by the elite. But if jade was used in divine communication, then this was a direct line to heaven. This is the world's oldest and tallest bronze tree. Nearly four meters in height, it had been deliberately burned and shattered into countless pieces. Now, here it is, in all its original splendor. Almost every ancient civilization worshipped a sacred tree. For some, it represented life. For others, it represented their entire universe. This is Sanxing Dui's divine tree. It was the stairway to heaven, the means with which to communicate with the very gods themselves. And an ancient text speaks of a legendary tree on which sat 10 birds. Every morning, a bird would carry the sun into the sky. Here, there are nine birds on Sanxing Dui's tree, but the top is broken, perhaps there was a tenth bird. The tree's base is shaped like a mountain. All these motifs of mountains, trees and birds share one thing in common. They represent the link between earth and the heavens. In fact, several bronze trees have been discovered at Sensing Dui. They've since lost their luster, but originally, all of this bronze would have been polished to the colour of gold. So this tree would have shone like the sun. On all of Sensing Dui's trees sit birds, powerful symbols of the sun. The ancient Egyptians believed their pharaohs were manifestations of Ra, the half-man, half-falcon god of the sun. At Sensing Dui, the prevalence of bird relics suggests a close relationship between humans and birds. Three of Sensing Dui's legendary kings are even named after birds. It seems the desire to be close to the sun to harness its life-giving powers was universal. Uh -huh. It's a little bit like a Lucha Libre, isn't it? They've turned them into cartoons. That's great. That's really how you get to the to the younger generation, isn't it? Just to make everything really hip and colorful and just cool, really. Uh -huh. Oh, well, they did say the pen is mightier than the sword, and if you've got a gold staff, and then this is as mighty as it gets. It's actually just as uh, intricate as on the actual gold staff.
。这是一个手链是吧？对，它是做的那个面具的。It seems San Xingdui's relics have been given a modern makeover. 它有英文的书。对，它有英文的。Oh, wow, cool. That's nice. Oh, that's great. They've got an English version. Yeah, wouldn't mind having this on my coffee table. But、uh, I'm pretty old-fashioned, so if I were to get a souvenir, I think I'd probably take this gentleman home. It's funny how some of the world's greatest archaeological finds was simply down to serendipity. But this is not the end either, because excavations are always underway here at San Xingdui, and you never know when there might be a new discovery that would forever change everything we know about San Xingdui and the Kingdom of the Shu.